From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Lisa Abramois in for Jonathan Farrow. This market wants to rally on this merger Monday, led by the Nasdaq up nine tenths of a percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. We begin with the big issue, the next big data point. We get CPI. Wednesday CPI. Another CPI reading coming out this week. Right. With this jobs report and the inflation number. It's really clear that they are on a path to continue to raise those rates. What Chair Powell told us is, well, he's data dependent. Certainly 75 basis points will be on the table. Look, the labor market right now is very strong. Inflation is very high. The Fed needs to do more here. The Fed needs to do more work. I'm just a little bit suspicious about how good the job data was on Friday. It's a little bit puzzling. CPI is more impactful in the short term to the markets. The inflation of 9% CPI. The Federal Reserve still has its work cut out for them. They're going to have to go even more. Joining us now is Morgan Stanley's Michael Kushba and Woody Caesar of Credit Sites. Michael, I want to start with you. How much will this CPI report that we get on Wednesday dictate the tone of what you project to happen going forward? I think it's very important. We've been waiting a long time for inflation to peak, to come down. People thought, markets thought on the springtime it may happen. It hasn't happened. Commodity prices, shelter prices, wage growth have all been keep surprising to the upside. So I think it's very important to, at a minimum, to have headline CPI peak. But more important than that is to have that core CPA start falling on a month-to-month -month basis. What's your view, Whitney? How much is it going to actually shape what you're looking at? How important is the CPI print? Well, Lisa, good morning. Thank you very much. I do agree with Michael that the CPI print is quite important, especially because the Fed has told the market that they are going to be data dependent, which means that they are specifically looking at CPI and other data points as well. But I think that the line items are really going to matter. We all know that headline inflation is probably going to decelerate on a month over month basis because we've seen a pretty nice uh, retracement in some of the energy commodity prices. But when it comes to core and services, that I think is what is really going to move the needle for the markets and investors as we need to see those components of CPI really start to slow down. And Michael, you mentioned that you need to see the inflation start to ease off, but there's a question about how much in order to trigger some sort of response from the Fed. Goldman's uh, Jan Hatzia said that the bar would be very high for a policy pivot and rate cuts, saying the hurdle for cuts in 2023 is high. If I look at market pricing, the market was obviously pricing some pretty significant cuts, but I think that probably would require an even weaker growth environment than what we have in our forecast. We've heard this from a number of different people. Well, Michael, do you agree? Is that really uh, what you're looking at is perhaps an overambitious market with how quickly the Fed will reverse course? I think that's that's very true. I think what we're talking about is a, an amelioration, a slowdown in the month on month paces to slow down the pace of rate hikes, not to have them stop or turn around and turn to rate in terms of rate cuts next year. We're talking about whether or not the Fed raises 50 basis points, 75 basis points or you know, an out-of-the-box number, 100 basis points in, in September, if this number turns out, suppose it goes up rather than coming down at the margin as the market forecasts, that could change the big-time expectations with regard to how much it tightens this year. Instead of only going to three and a quarter, three and a half, maybe the Fed needs to go to four if this number doesn't come down. So I think the risk is how much higher they go, not if they come down or not. Wendy, do you agree? And if that's the case, what would be the uh, ramifications, not only for the rates market, but also for credit? So I think that the credit market is very much focused on liquidity within the broader system and whether there is an ability to raise new capital, which as of last week, there was definitely a strong ability still for investment grade and high yield companies to come to market. I do think that one thing that we need to keep in mind is the Fed and Chair Powell have really emphasized the kind of delay in the 
uh, tightening of policy and then the actual reaction in the broader economy. So I do think that we need to keep in mind that the Fed is going to be data dependent, but also focusing on what is the lag effect of rate hiking. And so I think one of the reasons that we're not necessarily expecting to see a 4% Fed funds rate by the end of the year is because we do think there is going to be some tolerance for slowing down the pace of rate hikes so long as there's some evidence that inflation is starting to come down. And that would leave us biased to expect that the Fed is going to kind of slow down rate hikes and then try to hold rates steady for an extended period of time to see how the economy reacts. Well, this is uh, parsing into some of the data points the Fed says that they are depending on, and we get a lot of them this week. A host of economic data. Fed speak as well ahead of that Jackson Hole meeting. Uh, and we are looking also for the latest read, not only on inflation on, for CPI, but also at the University of Michigan Sentiment Survey on Friday. For more, Yelena Shulyetyeva of Bloomberg Economics joins us. Uh, Yelena, how important is the core figure going to be in this CPI report? Because the headline is expected to come down. How how important is it to see that the core level does come down to a significant degree for people to think perhaps that the Fed pivot is still in play? It will be crucial, and uh, I think that's what will drive inflation uh, in the next uh, few months. So uh, if you look at uh, the headline, as you mentioned, the, you know, everybody seems to agree that the headline is going to come down. And it, in fact, it's uh, uh, at a face value. It's consistent with 2% uh, inflation target. What, what really matters is core, how shelter prices are uh, going to uh, behave going forward and uh, other components. I think it's really important that, uh, you know, wage pressures don't don't um, you know show any signs of decelerating? The latest labor market re uh, report uh, on Friday showed that uh, every childly earnings just fail to decelerate. They they keep uh, running hot, and other data, including ECI, including Atlanta Fed uh, wage tracker, they all show wages are going uh, are growing and uh, at a, a significant pace. Yelena, what's your projection for how quickly the pace of CPI could come down? I mean, this is something that Michael had mentioned, and I want to get back to him on that in just a moment. But first, Yelena, I would love to get your sense of if we get to 8.8 percent, let's say, for headline CPI, how quickly could we, could we get back to four? And then how quickly can we get back down to that 2 percent target of the Fed? Well, not next year. I think uh, we we are at uh, around 8% for uh, CPI, uh, just slightly uh, lower on core by the end of this year. And we see very slow deceleration uh, going into next year. So I think the Fed will hike and will hike aggressively. And uh, actually, Bloomberg Economics is uh, probably the uh, highest in terms of Fed funds uh, for uh, the terminal rate. Thank you so much, Yelena Shulyetyeva, for joining us today. Michael Kushma and Winnie Caesar are still with us. Michael, what's your view on this, considering uh, that we do see this idea, even if you have a decline in inflation, how big of a decline do you have to get before the idea of pausing or slowing those rate hikes? Well, first of all, we can take into account that the Fed has, over the course of the last 12 months, have keep ratcheting up their inflation forecast. So they had targets for the end of 2022 and of 2023. And those numbers keep getting pushed higher because inflation has not shown signs of stabilizing, let alone come down. So first thing we have to see is stop going up you know, month on month and stop, uh, stop increasing month on month and start going down month on month. Inflation is persistent. It's going to be difficult to see a sudden drop in core, in core CPI anytime soon. So I think what we need to see is on a distinct downward trajectory such that by the fourth quarter, inside the fourth quarter, we see month on month changes which are annualized, which have a minimum a, a forehandle on it. That probably would be good enough, given lagged effects of monetary policy and the slow, slow trends in inflation, to make potentially make the Fed comfortable that policy now is tight enough to wait and see, become very data dependent to see how much inflation will continue to decelerate into 2023. But we start to have to see those numbers come down. So even in this month's forecast, you know, 0.5 percent annualized is still 6 percent core CPI. That number has to go get to a four annualized handle by the end of the year, sometime early in the fourth quarter, in order for I think the Fed to become more comfortable that inflation is on this persistent downward trajectory to meet their end of 2023 target.
And given that this is the debate when it comes to Fedland, the debate in markets are whether companies and, and stock traders and credit traders are accurately reflecting the risk embedded in a scenario of such a significant slowdown to bring that inflation rate to the Fed's target. I'm looking right now at NVIDIA with a, a projection and a, a preliminary second quarter revenue uh, projection that comes in below expectations. The so shares are tanking. They're at one point down as much as 8% ahead of the market open. Winnie, from a credit perspective, does it make sense to you that we just saw the biggest rally in high yield bonds going back to 2011 and that they have continued into the month of August? So I would say the magnitude of the rally has been quite surprising to us, but the direction of the rally is something that we were expecting. High yield and really broader corporate America, including investment grade, came into the slowdown just in really good kind of rock solid shape from a balance sheet perspective. It's no surprise that when you've pulled forward a lot of growth and also given issuers ultra low borrowing costs, that your starting point is going to be quite solid. Now, I do think that high yield relative to investment grade might be a little stretched at this point, but we're also looking at the changes in the distressed market, which has also been quite meaningful since the end of last quarter, where we're seeing far fewer distressed companies, especially in the world of triple Cs, which has pretty positive implications for forward default rates. And a lot of the liquidity conditions in the market are very much kind of self-fulfilling. If investors expect defaults, then they're going to kind of cut off liquidity to those lower rated issuers. And if they're not expecting defaults, if they're expecting that things are going to be a little bit more stable, then they're going to continue to allow for kind of uh, the life ropes that are needed to get through some of these more transitional times. Michael, your final word on credit? Uh, I, I think broadly, similarly, that the high yield market this year has benefited by a tremendous technical advantage, a very limited supply. New issue of bonds is, is running at record lows after record highs the previous couple of years. So high yield companies have done a really good job of shoring up their balance sheets, borrowing money when yields were low, and now being able to ride through this, this sell-off without having to raise new funds at these much higher yield levels. So I think that technical, uh, technical advantage with ongoing strong cash flow uh, uh, fund invest investors having coupon payments that need to be reinvested is a very strong technical dynamic. But on the other hand, the economy has slowed and is likely to stay on a slow trajectory going forward. There's a meaningful probability of recession next year. We think it's still going to be relatively mild, so default rates will not increase substantially. That longer term, high yield looks okay. But in the near term, given the rally we've seen in July, we do think it's a little stretched versus higher quality bonds. All right, Michael Kushma, Winnie Caesar, both of you are sticking with us. Right now, we want to get some of the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell. Abby Doolittle here with us. Abby. Hey, Lisa. Well, let's start out with what is working because we do, of course, have the futures higher. And one stock that is popping is Global Blood Therapeutics. This, of course, is Pfizer's buying the firm for $5.5 billion for its sickle cell therapy. Pfizer has made it very clear that it will be investing many of those COVID profits into new therapies. We have First Solar also higher up about 6%. Clean energy generally higher as that Inflation Reduction Act passed. A big portion of it, of course, for clean energy. And J.P. Morgan has upgraded First Solar to overweight from neutral. So two notches, the analysts saying there this is the biggest move for climate in terms of money being spent by the government. To the downside, though, Palantir, uh, it, of course, is tumbling as the data firm cuts both its annual revenue and profit outlook. Mainly government is the revenue breakup uh, breakdown, but it's also commercial slice that they've been trying to grow, but it looks like uh, maybe it's being seen as a nice to have as, as opposed to a need to have. And speaking of, Lisa, you were just talking about that pre-announcement from NVIDIA. There it is, down 7.3 percent. They have pre-announced the downside for revenues and Pretty significantly, the estimate was for $8.12 billion. They are saying that it will come in at $6.7 billion. They report on August 24th. Not a great sign for that big chip maker. And, of course, a lot of graphics, data. They've been trying to go into cars. What does this say about the U.S. economy? Abigail, thank you so much. Coming up, Senate Democrats giving President Biden's agenda a boost. We had many bumps in the road, many times when it looked like it would never happen. But we never gave up. And here we are. We got it done. That conversation coming up next. We do see a rally ahead of the open here, climbing that wall of worry. Those yields headed a little bit lower, particularly on the long end. The yield curve highly inverted. This is Bloomberg. At last.
last we've arrived, and we are elated and really confident that the Inflation Reduction Act will endure as one of the defining feats of the 21st century. Our bill reduces inflation, lowers costs, creates millions of manufacturing jobs, enhances our energy security. Senate Democrats bringing President Biden one step closer to legislative victory, passing the tax and climate bill key to his economic agenda ahead of those November elections. GOP Senator Pat Toomey criticizing the bill, saying, quote, Democrats insist on pouring fuel on the fire with another partisan tax and spending spree that will only further exacerbate a recession we're already likely in. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's very own Emily Wilkins from Washington, D.C. Emily, the voterama happened. I'm sure everybody slept on the floor of the Capitol as you try to track the votes. What is this going to do? How big of a deal is this legislation that the Senate passed and is now on track to go to the House? So it's a huge win for President Biden. It's a huge win for Senate Democrats. And the House is expected to be able to move it. They're going to come back and have that vote this Friday. I think the drill trick here is going to be, in terms of what impact it's going to have, it certainly will have an impact on things like renewable energy, an impact on lowering certain drug prices through Medicare. At the same point, I think there's a big question of exactly what kind of impact this is going to have on the November elections, which will be interesting to see. Certainly, this is a new tool in the Democrats' toolkit, something they can campaign on, something they can talk about. At the same point, inflation is still a number one concern for a lot of Americans, and it's going to be hard for them to say, hey, we passed this bill that's going to eventually implement all these things. This isn't something Americans are going to feel right away. And so this doesn't necessarily mean that Democrats are going to win in November just because they finally are now passing the signature piece of Biden's uh, agenda. From an analytical point of view, Emily, what's going to be the ramification? from the 1% tax on share buybacks, on uh, the 15% minimum tax that's going to be imposed on specific companies that typically have gotten away with uh, finding loopholes and other ways around some of the minimums. I mean, this is something that Democrats are really going to be able to tout. They've shown a lot of polling showing that folks don't think that a lot of companies are paying their fair share. At the same point, it does it does really apply to sort of the larger, bigger companies. They're trying to keep uh, impacts away from small and medium-sized businesses. And so this is something that Democrats are going to be able to, again, continue to tout as a victory on their behalf to their voters. It's also going to help pay for this overall legislation. Remember, a big thing that Senator Joe Manchin was pushing for was for this bill to reduce the overall federal deficit, which it does thanks to provisions like the $15 minimum corporate tax rate, as well as the 1% tax on stock buybacks. Meanwhile, Emily Wilkins, thank you so much uh, down in Washington, D.C. for that. Michael Cushman, and Winnie Caesar back with us. Uh, Michael, from your perspective, another component of this bill was to reduce the deficit to some degree and try to shore up the national profile. How much does that actually have a market, a tangible market read through on the fixed income side, which does hinge on the creditworthiness of the United States. Uh, longer term, it's it's important because longer term, the U.S. fiscal situation is not really sustainable. Running deficits, you know, five six percent of GDP when things are relatively good. So what happens when the next recession comes or big recession comes, which will eventually happen at some point in the next several years? The deficit gets grows, grows, grows. In addition to that, the era of very very low ultra low interest rates seems over as well. So the interest expense on the national debt grows as a percentage of, of federal expenditures, which unless other tax Taxes are raised, that will eat away in program spending across the board. And since there's a lot of mandated spending, legally mandated spending, that affects discretionary spending. So the ability to bring down deficits and slow the growth of national debt when times are really good is important longer term. Otherwise, we will run into a situation down the road. Again, down the road, don't know exactly when, where they, there will be a premium, a, some kind of extra premium put on long dated um, U.S. Treasuries. And Winnie, from a credit perspective, there's an analog here that's pretty direct, which is that you've seen companies refinance and push out maturities really far into the distance during uh, the post pandemic debt boom that we saw fueled by Fed money. How much do we see companies actually paying down their debt more significantly in anticipation of higher rates to come, both on the interest rate side as well as credit? So we haven't seen a lot of outright debt pay down quite yet. 
And I think that it would take a pretty material and sustainable move higher in yields for corporate America to say, okay, we actually need to, in aggregate, reduce our debt loads across the board. Now, what we have seen is some nice deleveraging from kind of the peak po- pandemic prints because we've seen earnings growth come back online. And when we look at some of the other important credit ratios, things like interest coverage or the ability to service debt, that is still at very, very elevated levels. And so in order for corporate America to say, okay, actually we need to start to change our behavior significantly, you'd need to start to see those coverage ratios come down from a combination of higher borrowing costs or lower earnings, or alternatively start to see the ratings agencies get really proactive in terms of downgrades, especially from triple Bs to double Bs. Uh, So Winnie, do you foresee a problem if rates go to that 4% just quickly? So if rates go to 4%, I don't actually see that as a particular problem given that spreads are still relatively intact. You know, it would all depend on kind of the, the broader economic outlook and what was going on in the background, but we would actually need to see a pretty significant move higher in rates for a lot of balance sheets to be unsustainable in nature. Of course, at the margin, there would be some stresses, but in aggregate, that wouldn't necessarily be a really kind of critical um, downgrade moment across the broader market. Winnie Caesar, Michael Kushba, to thank both of you. Thank you so much for being with us. Just to give you a sense, President Biden currently is speaking. He is on his way from Rehoboth, Delaware, on to Kentucky to visit some of the victims of the recent flooding there. Uh, he did give uh, some comments as he now heads onto the plane. We will track that uh, coming up, the morning calls, and later, Stuart Kaiser of UBS seeing recession risks fully priced into markets. That conversation still ahead. We are seeing a rally ahead of the open here. Is the wall of worry dissipates against the potential opportunities that gloom giving way, although perhaps uh, not as uh, much of a gain as it was earlier. NASDAQ up 36. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our morning calls. A look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up, Ken Accord raising its price target on Tesla to 881, expecting EV momentum to remain secure. Next up, Pivotal Research cutting Roku to sell with a $60 price target, citing valuation concerns. And then finally, JP Morgan downgrading Carvana to underweight, seeing unattractive risk reward with limited growth visibility. Coming up, UBS's Stuart Kaiser. This is Bloomberg. This is Countdown to the Open. I'm Lisa Abramois in for Jonathan Farrow. Moments away from the start of trading, we are seeing a bit of the momentum. Lose steam just a touch ahead of here with three-tenths of a percent gain for the NASDAQ 100. How much of that is led by NVIDIA, which is tanking? Uh, Russell 2000 up seven-tenths of a percent. S&P up five-tenths of a percent. A bid into Treasuries, and that has been a theme, which is fascinating, especially in light of the CPI that came out, uh, that's going to come out on Wednesday. We are seeing a bid in, particularly to the, sh- the long end, down uh, to 2.78 percent a bit of dollar weakness across the board the euro 101.98 and crude uh, steadily below 90 dollars a barrel 88.26 just shocking to see how much that has come off joining us now with a look at the stocks moving uh, at the opening of bell here's kitty greifeld kitty lisa i've got four gainers for you today let's start with signify help it is surging this morning after a 16 percent rally last week that's on reports that cvs is preparing a bid for the company the logic there is that signify would help expand the cvs home health unit you can see signify shares up almost 16 percent plug power too rising it's a big morning really for the clean tech sector after the senate passed the tax climate and drugs bill last night democrats calling it the largest u.s investment ever in fighting climate change. That's putting a bid under the likes of Plug Power, a hydrogen and fuel cell company, and Tesla, too, leading the rally in EVs on the back of this bill, which extends a $7,500 per vehicle tax credit 
Finally, Bed Bath & Beyond rising for a ninth straight day, including Friday's 33% surge. The fundamental reason might be that it might sell debt to the P.E. market. But, Lisa, we know it's seeing heavy retail interest, as you can see in today's 40% rally already. Yeah, I was looking at the price action and thinking, did anything really happen? Katie Greifeld, thank you so much. Stocks extending their climb from June lows. The team over at Nomura are calling it, quote, an angst-ridden pain trade, leading to an increasingly unstoppable FOMO type behavior. For more, let's bring in Abigail Doolittle of Bloomberg. Abby. Well, Gleason, it is really interesting that the in this year of so many declines, the bear market, that we could now be talking about FOMO, but that's exactly right. Because, of course, remember July for the S&P 500, up more than 9%, the most since November of 2020. Combination of less bad earnings, the Fed hiking not 75 basis points instead of 100. That really has stirred the animal spirits on this idea of maybe a new Fed put uh, or Fed pivot, depending on whether or not you think that. So take a look at these uh, sectors just roaring higher over the last month. Discretionary, Infotex, those are basically the mega cap tech sectors. But you also have industrials and utilities rounding it out. So a very healthy, broad-based rally. But it's interesting because a lot of investors are actually missing out on this, not surprisingly because of this year's bear market, that downtrend still in place. If we take a look at the CFTC positioning, most recently we have the shorts, the most short uh, it's going all the way back to uh, let's call it 2015-2016. Uh, so again, a lot of uh, folks are actually missing out on this rally, including uh, some of the institutional money. And then finally, Lisa, if we take a look at options, it's interesting because there's some mixed messages here. Now, the VIX seems to be dropping out of a year-long uh, uptrend. That could suggest that more gains are ahead. On the other hand, the SKU index, which a lot of traders and investors don't like because of its unpredictability, but over the last couple of years, it's been more predictable. It's long out of the money, uh, out of the money uh, puts, it is creeping higher. It tends to be very early. So you put those two together, it may suggest that this rally could have legs over the next couple of weeks or even months. But watch that skew index. If it goes super high, it could suggest that maybe that downtrend will remain in place. The future is clear as mud. Abigail, thank you so much. <laughs> Meanwhile, Wall Street profit warnings piling up. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson put out a great note over the weekend, expecting higher input prices to dent profit margins. Goldman's David Costin echoing that view, looking for net margins to fall by 25 basis points in 2023 with a contraction in every sector. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons joining us now for more. Kaylee. Well, Lisa, if you look backward at earnings for the second quarter, they really haven't been so bad. On average, earnings are up about 8.7 percent. They're beating expectations by about 4.3 percent, and that has helped lend a boost to this equity market. The S&P up 9.4 percent over the course of earnings season since J.P. Morgan reported. That's actually the best start to an earnings season going all the way back to 1997. We are talking 25 years. But Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs obviously don't think that rally is going to last because earnings just aren't going to be as resilient looking for. Forward. Both of them, as you said, expecting profit margins to contract next year due to those price pressures. We'll, of course, get a read on that later on this week with the producer price inflation, which is a critical uh, indicator for profit margins, while consumer price inflation obviously is critical for the Federal Reserve. But that is really the, the gist of it here, that they are facing higher input, uh, input costs. They're not going to have as much success passing them on as demand starts to wane, and that's going to create a problem for profits. Of course, Goldman saying that there will be a contraction in every sector. He thinks it will be led by materials, energy, and healthcare. But in another sector, technology, you've already started to see expectations being lowered for this year. Now just 11.2% profit growth seen for 2022. That's down from the near 13% expected just at the beginning of July. So the downward revisions have started, Lisa, but if you believe the bears out there, there's still a long way to go. Kaylee Lines, thank you. Uh, one person who's been tracking all of the is Stuart Kaiser, who has uh, been staying more optimistic. Stuart Kaiser of UBS, he's written, quote, we see strong growth data is good for risk assets as they trim recession tail risks and continue to see a high bar for large cuts to earnings estimates given the positive nominal U.S. growth. Stuart, I am so happy to say, is in studio with us, sitting right next to me here. Stuart, I'd love to get your sense of just how much you can fight the negativity that you're hearing across Wall Street, whether it's Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs, and say, you guys are wrong. Things are going to hang in. And can't you just tell what we've seen? What gives you that confidence? Uh, I think, you know, a big part of this positioning that, that Abby just touched on, I think, in particular, is retail investors have started to put money into markets. Buybacks are picking up considerably. And institutional investor positioning is just not there. And I think that speaks to how low expectations were. 
And the fact that data is coming in better than expectations, I think, is starting to pull people in a bit. If you look at the bear case to earnings, a lot of people have been you know, talking about 15% negative revisions to forward S&P estimates. Those have been revised down 2% during 2Q earnings. So I think just the negativity that was priced in just isn't realizing itself yet. And you know, from our perspective, that gives you a little bit more space for the market to push higher because we don't expect inflation to be a negative outcome this month. Expectations are low, positioning is low, and we think you have some room here. Um, you know, are we going to rally through year end? Probably not, but we, you know, we definitely think you know, through the month of August feeling pretty good. So is it coherent to see a yield curve that is so deeply inverted? We are seeing the most inversion going back to the year 2000. It is, is it coherent to see enough weakness in the market that the Fed pivots with this idea that earnings will remain resilient? Yeah, I think this is the ultimate trade-off between inflation and growth, right? And the, the fact is, right now, the Fed is prioritizing inflation risks. And that's calmed the market down. It's got inflation expectations, market-based inflation expectations lower. The natural knock-on is that should have a negative impact on growth, right? So the Fed is trying to balance these two things. And our view is, because we've seen strong growth data recently, that gives the Fed a little more space and a little more wiggle room to keep that inflation tail risk you know, at bay because the growth data hasn't slowed meaningfully. I guess the way we put this is you'd rather have one tail risk than two. And right now they have one tail risk, which is inflation they're dealing with. As long as that growth data remains solid and the employment data remains solid, we consider that a net positive for markets. I know that's a little bit out of consensus, but that's kind of where we sit. So what about consumer discretionary? And the reason why I point to this is partly because this is John Farrow's property and he has railed against this rally and he said it doesn't make sense. Does it make sense to you, given that if there is some sort of weakening enough to give the Fed confidence to back away, that would be really negative for consumer discretionary. I think, I think it'd be negative for the consumer discretionary to the extent that the labor market comes, comes under real pressure. But I think there's two aspects to this. There's how is the data coming in and what were the expectations, right? The data recently, obviously the jobs report was, <laughs> was a little unique, but generally speaking, the data hasn't been home run level data. It's just that expectations were so incredibly low, right? And that's what's gotten the market to rally. I think, you know, what John's communicating and what I think a lot of the other strategists are is that the Fed needs to cause a recession to deal with inflation. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that's the case, number one. And number two, there's a timing aspect to this. If that recession is 18, 24 months in the future, the market's not going to trade it yet, right? What the market is trading right now is inflation under control and the very negative expectations we had are not being realized within kind of our investment window. Okay, so let's go to the CPI report then on Wednesday and then PPI on Thursday, giving that sense of that margin compression that you heard Morgan Stanley, uh, Mike Wilson over there speak about how quickly do you have to see it come down to still confirm your belief versus question it and say, wait a second, the Fed might have to go a bit further. Yeah, look, I mean, inflation is going to decelerate meaningfully month on month. You know, we have, you have headline estimates somewhere between 10 to 20 basis points. You have core estimates somewhere probably between 40 and 50, which would be significant deceleration from last month. And for that reason, we don't think it's as big a negative event this month um, as it has been. But to your point, those levels are still unsustainable going forward, right? So we need to see not only those levels print this month, but I think we need them to, uh, con you know, consistently step down in coming months. You know, so that the Fed is then comfortable that they can back off the accelerator a little bit. I mean, look, the Fed faced a very tricky inflation tail risk, and they've been very aggressive in terms of front-loading hikes to deal with that. The markets responded positively. They've taken down market-based inflation expectations. Now we're in kind of the prove-it window, right? We need to actually see the data come in so that things can ease up a bit. What will the leadership be for the next six months? Six months is a little, a little much. I think, you know, Month, for, for us, like, I mean, we're, <laughs> look, we're still in the large cap tech, lar large cap tech and quality bandwagon right now. Um, and the logic here is because of the policy stance. The Fed is prioritizing inflation risks, which have been the strongest headwind for tech, um, at the expense of growth risks. In a decelerating growth environment, if you believe that's what we're in, well, then you want to be in, in companies with stable, defensible earnings, strong balance sheet, and high-quality companies, which we think puts you in things like NASDAQ relative to small cap. So at the highest level, it's your sort of long NASDAQ, short, small cap for the next one to three months. What keeps you up at night, then? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think, look, what keeps us up at night is, is a lot of the data outside of non-farm payrolls hasn't looked as good. So the, the non-farm payroll piece is the one bright spot in economic growth. And if you look across the ocean, European data looks pretty horrible. So this isn't only a U.S. issue, right? You have 
outside of payrolls, the U.S. economy appears to be slowing. Outside of the U.S., we're also seeing meaningful slowing. So it could be that the non-farm payrolls and the employment in the U.S. is giving us a bit of a false signal about the strength of the U.S. economy. And if that's the case, then a lot of these hard landing outcomes get drawn forward a bit. Okay, this is actually a really fascinating point, and it possibly is the reason why we're seeing more gains today, right? Because people are looking at that uh, non-farm payrolls from Friday and saying, look, this is actually really strong. And so that's good. If you're only dealing with inflation, we can deal with that to that point, right? Uh, back in 2021, seems like a long time ago, we got data that was revised upward, right, where we had a better than expected labor market, and that completely changed the profile of the markets as well as uh, how people were projecting the economy. What happens if we get a redux of that? How significant of a change would that mean for you? If, if the data was revised up or down? Down. Down. Uh, Significantly. I mean, th th that'd, be, that'd be a major change, right? Because then I think what you're saying is this, this growth risk is A, larger, and B, closer than we thought it might have been. And in that case, then, then, yeah, I think you start to get in a situation where the Fed is in a lot of trouble because they still need to keep inflation anchored. But now they have both the political and the economic pressure from weakening growth. And I think that's a, that's a very dangerous risk for the markets because, like, in our view, the, almost the worst case outcome is if the Fed gets scared off of rate hikes because growth is decelerating so much, I think that's actually the worst case. Because what you're going to do is reintroduce inflation risk because they back off of the rate hikes, yeah. but now you've added growth risk. And so now you're in that two-tail scenario. And I think that's exactly what they want to avoid. All right. Well, we're going to stick with this. So, Stuart Kaiser, don't go anywhere. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk about China ramping up military activity near Taiwan. I'm not worried, but I'm concerned that they're moving as much as they are. But I don't think they're going to do anything wrong. Do you have a line to go to Taiwan? Speaker Pelosi's visit continuing to weigh on U.S.-China tensions. That conversation is still ahead. We are seeing that rally in markets, perhaps on that uh, jobs report that we got on Friday showing more strength in the labor market than many people thought. From New York, this is Bloomberg. But I'm concerned that they're moving as much as they are. But I don't think they're going to do anything wrong. Do you have a line to go to Taiwan? I've heard China ramping up military activity near Taiwan in the wake of Speaker Pelosi's visit, extending some of the sorties over that region. This coming as Secretary Blinken travels to the Philippines to reaffirm its alliance amid escalating tensions. Our relationship is quite extraordinary because it is really founded in friendship. Uh, it's forged as well uh, in partnership, and it's strengthened by the fact that it's an alliance as well. The people ties between us are almost uh, unique, and it's something that we tremendously value. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew joining us now from Washington, D.C. Joe, how significant are the sorties that China's been doing, some of the military operations uh, and practice runs around Taiwan? Well, they're very significant in that we haven't seen uh, this level of incursion, if I can use that word, to date. Obviously, China's working hard to intimidate Taiwan, and it is uh, making some others in the region a bit uncomfortable. You know, nothing makes friends like a common foe here, and that's why we saw Secretary Blinken in the Philippines. He's the first cabinet secretary to visit, and President Biden has invited uh, the relatively new president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., to the White House, although nothing has been scheduled on that yet. But I would expect to see a lot more language like this, not only touring through the region on behalf of the Secretary of State, but language here in the United States that seeks to temper uh, what China is up to in Taiwan. Meanwhile, Joe, how much is the U.S. Uh, trying to build up its potential response to a, an invasion by China and the mainland and into uh, Taiwan? Well, my goodness, that's not something that is expected okay. uh, to happen anytime soon, just to be clear. But look, uh, I, we're prepared for a lot of various scenarios. The question is, would we in fact uh, step up militarily if Taiwan were attacked. President Biden has said so, and the White House has attempted to clarify those remarks so as to not suggest some change in policy. But after what we've seen uh, over the past week here, following, during and following Nancy Pelosi's visit, to see Taiwan essentially surrounded is changing some minds here, or at least creating a new conversation here in Washington about what exactly the U.S. would do, whether it's now or 10 years from now. And I think we do have some time to figure that out. But in the meantime, it's about diplomacy. It's about going to places like the Philippines, where we have a, a mutual defense treaty dating back to the 1950s, going to Japan and other parties in the region that the U.S. is trying to 
to, you know, consolidate that diplomatic power to influence Beijing. Joe, thank you so much. China's trade surplus also hitting another record in July. This came out uh, over the weekend. This is the country's COVID zero policy continues to weigh on domestic demand. Damian Sassauer of Bloomberg Intelligence joining us now. These numbers were confusing to some. They came in much better than expected in terms of exports uh, versus the imports. What do you make of this? Is this a sign of the lack of imports or is it a sign of something else in terms of the nature of the exports? Well, Lisa, it has to do with the price effect. I mean, half of the move in, in terms of China having this record trade surplus Plus is due to the move in commodity prices. And so, look, beneath the surface, on the export side of the ledger, this has got to be about auto, steel, and textiles. And specifically, let's focus on autos. I mean, Great Wall and Geely, China's two largest auto manufacturers, have doubled their market share in Russia. Exports to Russia were up 22% year over year. You can see China filling that gap, and you can see them reaping the benefits of it, Lisa. And I think that's where some of the focus needs to lie here. All right, Damien Sassauer, thank you so much. We're going to have uh, more on that coming up. Stuart Kaiser is still with us. And Stuart, I got to say, some of the developments over in China have been some of the biggest wild cards. How much do you view what's going on in terms of how much uh, oil prices have come down? Is really the lack of demand from an economy still shut down in so many places? I think that has a lot to do with it. I mean, China, excuse me, oil has been a really interesting test case this year where the, the underlying fundamentals, if you talk to an energy expert, sound phenomenal, but the sort of tidal wave of macro global economic slowing is just sort of washed that away. And right, I think you could uh, draw a parallel to even home building. If you talk to a lot of home builders, analysts, they'll tell you how good, you know, single stock fundamentals are, and the macro is just sort of washed over it. So I think a lot of what you're seeing in China is, is excuse me, in oil is frankly the market pricing slower China, but also slower U.S. and slower, slower Euro, uh, Europe demand. The first six months of 2022 were all about commodities as the main hedge against inflation. Those shares, whether it was copper, whether it was uh, coal, or whether it was oil, all did phenomenally well. Is this going into reverse? Would you sell into this uh, to gain the, the gains that you've already gotten, lock those uh, gains in, and move to the next phase of the cycle, which is perhaps a little bit more of a downdraft? Uh, you know, we've been recommending hedging oil outperformance or energy share outperformance for the last couple of months. And I think that makes a lot of sense going, going through the summer, given, given the recession risks that out, are out there. But uh, honestly, it's hard to imagine um, in September and October ahead of heating season in the U.S. and Europe, you know, oil remaining under pressure. So I think from our perspective, it's more of a tactical hedge than it is, you know, kind of stepping away from, from the commodity complex. Obviously, if you have a hard landing outcome, then, then that changes things. But it's really hard to imagine going into European heating season. Uh, you know, doing that. There's a, a more sensitive question, and it's one that I keep thinking about, and I was speaking a lot uh, about with different people over the weekend, which is the idea of companies in the United States making uh, goods and using China as the factory to the world. And there have been a number of surveys showing that companies that announce that they are reshoring or onshoring production that previously was in, chi in China, uh, was done in China, are being rewarded. How do you sort of look at this in your portfolio as you parse through this data? You know, we're not looking at that, that specifically. What I would say is, I mean, even a lot of our COVID tests are being made in China. So this is sort of, a, you know, a highly, highly political charge, charge issue. I, I, my view on that would be if... If onshoring is positive politically, I think that's probably good for companies. The fact is though, that does increase production costs at a time when inflation and the consumer wallet is under so much pressure. I think you're going to have you know, folks looking at that as more of a, a short-term phenomenon that, as opposed to something that, that's long-lasting. I mean, if a, if a consumer is really under price pressure, um, you know, th their ability to trade up, you know, simply for made in America reasons, maybe maybe sort of time dependent. In other words, this is uh, something that loses clout very quickly when it comes to how much people are paying. Just on a broader issue, though, you were talking about Europe and how the U.S. isn't the only one and they're doing a lot better than other nations. Mm -hmm. How much do you need Europe to do a little bit better? Do you need China's GDP to come in with a four handle rather than the three handle that some are expecting in order to maintain your constructive view on U.S. equities? Uh, I, I think it, I mean, it's an important input. Obviously, you know, the S&P 500 in particular generates a, a lot of revenues internationally. And if your two largest trading partners are going into recession or, or slowing meaningfully, that's obviously, you know, a big headwind to it. And I think also for political purposes, you'd like to see European growth, you know, kind of stabilized given, given the war in Ukraine. So, look, it's an input without a doubt. And also because it's impacted the value of the dollar. Um, and, you know, obviously high, higher, higher dollar, you know, reduces earnings, you know, generated abroad. So there's a number of, uh, of impacts here. For me, the, the number one 
China's growth, though, right? If, you, if you're concerned about global recession outcomes, then, yeah, you want to see China and European growth stabilize as much as possible. Stuart Kaiser, thank you so much for being here in studio. We really appreciate it. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary in the markets. What we do see is a uh, green across the board, in particular led by certain big tech names, not NVIDIA. Uh, that's down and down hard. But Amazon shares up more than 2%. Meta up more than 4%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Time now for the Trading Diary. What you need to be watching in the week ahead. President Biden traveling to Kentucky. We'll get the latest read on inflation in America with CPI on Wednesday. Plus, Fed speak coming from Evans and Kashkari. U.S. PPI in another round of initial jobless claims on Thursday. And rounding out the week with the University of Michigan sentiment survey on Friday. Right now, you are seeing that rally extend. This was Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 